Good evening and welcome to tonight's Bible study with the Lombard Church of the Nazarene. We're so glad that you joined us tonight as we continue to study God's Word together. Tonight we're going to be looking at an introduction to the book of Colossians. Over the last so many weeks we've been talking about Paul's different missionary journeys and on his fourth missionary journey he went uh, to Rome. He was imprisoned there and was able to stay in a house under guard. People could come and go and visit him and he also wrote letters while he was there. And uh, one of the letters we talked about previously was uh, the book of Philemon. Philemon was a man who lived in Colosse and there was a church there. And so the book of Colossians is written to that church. Again, the author of this book is the Apostle Paul. And uh, it is known as one of the prison epistles. Uh, people believe that the books of Ephesians, Philemon, and Colossians were all written around the same time when Paul was imprisoned for two years in Rome. And so they're known as prison epistles. Prison because he was in prison, and epistles meaning letters. So these are letters that Paul wrote in prison to the Ephesians, Philemon, and to the Colossians. And we're going to take a look at the book of Colossians tonight. The church of Colossae, or the people of Colossae called Colossians, uh, is in a place what we would call modern day Turkey. It's just east of a place you see in the map there of Ephesus. So he wrote a letter to the Ephesians and nearby was this church of Colossae. Most people believe that this church in Colossae started during Paul's third missionary journey. Paul on that journey spent time in Ephesus and they believe maybe up to three years and so while he was there that this church in a nearby town in Colossae got started in a home in Philemon's home and so Paul didn't necessarily start this church or didn't necessarily um, even visit this church but he wanted to reach out and send a letter to the people there uh, Colossae, this land here, it was known as a, a place for people to stop on, on the trade route. And they, the people there were known for making beautiful dark red wool cloth, known as Colosseum, uh, for which the city became famous. But um, they eventually got less well known as a city because another city popped up called Laodicea, which you might have heard about in the book of Revelation. That city became a little bit more prominent during the competition. But those towns, along with a, another town called Hierapolis, were all destroyed in earthquakes in AD 17 and again in AD 60. They rebuilt after those, but Colossae never had its prominence again after that. So this letter that Paul writes to the, to the Colossians deals with various topics, which include um, false teachings that uh, obviously a lot of people were dealing with. There were false teachings going on. Uh, whenever there's truth, there's the enemy plants a lie. Um, to encourage believers in, in their faith, to encourage them to keep on growing into more and more mature followers of Jesus Christ, to declare that Jesus is superior to anyone's authority and to have them unite together in faith in Jesus Christ. He wants them to pursue holiness and fight against the sinful nature and uh, to live holy lives in Christian homes and households. And so these are different things that Paul addresses as he writes this letter to Colossians, and we'll look at that in, in the upcoming weeks. Today, we're just going to look at a brief introduction. We talked about where the city is and what it was known for. Let's take a look at the introduction of this letter, uh, the first uh, few verses. Uh, again, it begins in Colossians 1, 1 by Paul saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. And so uh, a lot of times when we are taught to write letters here, we write a letter and we start off to who it's for, and then at the end we write our name of who it's from. Um, here in this time period, Paul begins by saying, Paul, this is from me. And he starts off with a similar greeting as he did with Philemon. And he goes, and not just from him, but Timothy who is there with him. And Timothy who was known as a son of Paul, a spiritual son, here he calls brother. And not just Paul's brother, our brother. So he's saying to the people in Colossae, hey, we have a brother, Timothy. He's with me and we're writing this letter together, Paul and Timothy. In verse 2, it goes on to say, To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. 
So now he says who he's writing this to. Not as an individual like he did with Philemon. It is to the people in Colossae, the holy people. It's to the church in Colossae, to the brothers and sisters. We are part of the family of God. We are all brothers and sisters, and God is our Father in the family of God in the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. And so it might have gone to that church that was meeting in uh, Philemon's home that we talked about last time. And so um, it's going out to the brothers and sisters. And again, he says grace and peace, which we've talked about in the past. Remember, the Greeks would commonly greet each other with grace, and the Jews would commonly greet each other with peace. They would say shalom. And here he says grace and peace to you from our God, our Father. Amen. Verses 3 and 4 go on to say, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and for all the love that you have for God's people. So now Paul, after said who he is and who he's writing to, he goes on to say that he's praying for them, and that Paul believes in prayer and he's praying for the church. And I hope you pray today for the church, and we and we appreciate all the prayers of, of of God's people. But he says, I thank God for you. And why? Why does he thank God for them? He says, because of their faith and love. And the faith and love that they have for all God's people. It's not only for certain people, it's for all of God's people. That their faith in God is evident. That the love, authentic love, is there for all people. Um, similarly to the things he said to Philemon, who was there in the, his, whose home they might have been meeting in. In verse 5, he goes on to say, The faith and love that spring out from the hope stored up in you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. So remember, he's talking about faith and love from the past verse, and he goes, uh, I'm thanking God for the faith and love that you have. But now here he says, The faith and love that spring out from the hope stored up in you. Where do faith and love come from? He said that it comes from the hope that is stored up up for you in heaven it's a supernatural hope that comes from the kingdom of heaven and and they have a hope stored up in heaven and and it's evident in them they believe that the things of this world are temporary they believe that the the struggles of this life are temporary they know that who god is in control they know who jesus is they know their salvation is secure they know and they are grateful for that and because of the hope that they have they can live in faith they can live in love because of the work that god is doing in them and that hope that they have and and where did this hope come from well it came from god it says it came from and being stored up in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but it says it, it came from this true love, I mean, this true gospel that they've heard, this message that they heard. See, there's power in the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And when we hear about the good news of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, and the, it changes us and it gives us a hope in Jesus Christ. It gives us a hope in our Lord and in, in eternity and in heaven. And that, that good news turns into hope in our lives. And that hope that we have in Jesus Christ uh, blossoms out of us in faith and love. And so we see this progression that Paul is pointing out to the people, this church here in Colossae. In verse 6, he says, In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing among you since the day that you heard it and truly understood God's grace. He's saying just how I'm talking about the gospel has blossomed into hope and then into faith and into love, into your lives. I want you to know that the gospel, the good news, is bearing fruit all around the world. There is power in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus Christ, and it's bearing fruit everywhere that is spread ever since people hear it their lives are changed and it begins to bear fruit when we accept the seeds of the gospel it changes us and changes our environment and the people around us hallelujah these people they truly understood God's grace God's uh, grace we don't deserve it uh, but we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the message of the good news of the gospel is that he loves us all and made a way for us to be restored. And when we understand that message of God's grace, it changes us. Hallelujah. In verses 7 and 8, he says, You learned it from Epaphras, our dear 
fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told you, uh, sorry, told us of your love in the spirit. Epaphras must be their, their leader, uh, uh, somebody who at least shared the gospel with them and maybe helped start the church. Um, might be the pastor of the church. It might have been somebody who just helped start the church in Philemon's home. Um, see, Philemon could have opened up his home and somebody else be the spiritual leader. Um, there are many ways God could choose to move. Uh, or maybe he led Philemon and his household first, and that's where it began. But he's saying the good news is planted, and when it's planted and accepted and truly understood, it grows and bears fruit, and that's what happened there with you. And it was brought to you by this sower Epaphras. Hallelujah. And he taught them about God's grace. And he says, and we've also heard from Epaphras here in Rome, and he told us about your love in the Spirit. And that's how we know about the faith and love that you have. Verse 9 then, he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit comes. Paul heard of the church, and again, that's where he says, for this reason I have not stopped uh, praying for you, because he heard about them. From the day he heard about them and what God was doing there, he started praying for them. He added them to their, his prayer list and began to pray. And again, remember to keep praying for the church and he, for the knowledge of God's will. He wants them to understand God's will and the knowledge of God's will, the understanding of what God wants for them and for them to do and how to do it. That's what we should be praying for as well. What does God want to do through our lives? How does he want to accomplish it? And that's gonna, they're going to get the knowledge of God's will through wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So basically, Paul's praying that the Holy Spirit would work in their lives and give them wisdom and understanding. And that wisdom and understanding will help them know God's will. And we need to be praying that for ourselves and for the church as well. That the Holy Spirit would work and give us wisdom and understanding in a way that we would know what God's will is. Verses 10 through 12 say this, So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Well, there's a lot there, but he's just saying, um, please God with your life, bear fruit, do good works, grow in knowledge, be strengthened and empowered, keep persevering, endure to the very end, don't give up. And he wants us to share in the inheritance of the kingdom of the light. He wants us to persevere through the end and get to the end to where we share in the inheritance. And so he's just encouraging them, keep going, keep bearing fruit, keep doing good work, keep growing in knowledge, keep growing in strength and in power. Hallelujah. And then in verses 13 and 14, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. We are in the kingdom because he rescued us. And we thank God for this good news, this gospel. He made a way for us. Hallelujah. He rescued us and now we are, are, are set free and in the kingdom. And we are rescued from what? From the dominion of darkness. We were all in darkness. And it's not just darkness. There's a dominion of darkness. There's a power. There's a weight. Uh, a, a presence that is trying to pull us and keep us in darkness. But we are serve a God who is the kingdom of light and brings us out of that dominion to where we can gain wisdom and understanding and we can see and know the truth. We can be forgiven. We can be redeemed. Hallelujah. And Paul's just encouraging the people there. As we conclude this introduction here and take a moment to pray, Know that this was an in, just an introduction to this letter. Uh, mine says introduction or thanksgiving and prayer. Um, these first four, 14 verses. Verse 15, though, then continues into the body of this letter that talks about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. We'll look at that the next time and move through this letter. But um, if Paul was writing us a letter, what would he want us to hear about? 
Did you ever think about that? What would he say to the church today? <laughs> what does God want to say to us? Well, we must pray that the Holy Spirit gives us understanding and wisdom today so that we would know the will of God as well. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for this letter that you wrote through Paul to this church in Colossae. Help us to learn and grow from it. Help us to be encouraged by it. Help us, Lord, uh, to get understanding. Holy Spirit, work in us. Give us understanding and wisdom so that we would know what to do, know what your will is, and that we would be obedient to it. May we grow in strength and power. May we bear more fruit. Help us to be fruitful. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll continue to look at more of Colossians in the weeks to come. Remember, God loves you, and so do we.